Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are in the presence of a cultural icon, a physical specimen, a controversialist, a master orator, a champ. And we've also got Andrew Tate. <laughs> <laughs> that was smooth. I like that. I was sitting there thinking, I'll take this introduction. I'll take this. But uh, thank you. How are you doing, man? I'm good, Gee. You? You're good, yeah? Yeah, man. Asha, congratulations on your Islam, bro, man. Thank you, my friend. You know, the, the Muslim community really welcomes you, man. Yeah, it's been pretty divided. We've had a, I've had a whole bunch of support. Yes. Obviously, there's been some people who are not quite pleased about the idea. I think when you have a passionate subject and people that are truly engulfed in an idea, you're going to have some degree of polarization. Um, I think that maybe when you look in the online space, that might be your impression. But in reality, on the ground, I mean, that's definitely not the case. I would say the vast majority of people, 80, 90 percent, are completely happy about this. And, and it's, just, it's just that the minority have a very loud voice. Well, that's exactly it. That's the whole problem with the Internet as a whole, not just Islam, but the Internet as a whole is about vocal minorities that look look much larger than they are, right? Yes. And, and I agree with you, and I'd, I'd like to I like to hear that, but the reason I know what you're saying is true is because it's the same even in my case in other subjects. Online, I have all this, some kind of hate or people trying to disagree with me, but when I walk through life, I have 30,000 interactions with people and not a single one's ever been negative, ever. Yes, so it's, yes. it is crazy how the vocal minority is amplified the, on the social media. The main thing to note, though, is that Islam, it completely wipes away your sins. I mean... Uh, most of the companions of the Prophet had done many things which are heinous and uh, polytheism. And, I mean, for us as Muslims, polytheism is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. And so there is a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, where he states that Islam, it, it completely yuhdimu ma qabla. It destroys everything before. It means it wipes away everything before it. In other words, your slate is absolutely clean. Now, if there are some people who are actually coming and, and giving you a bit of a hard time, that's actually their problem. Yeah. Because in reality, honestly, bro, this, this is completely un-Islamic. I mean, so that's the, that's the first thing. There's actually a verse in the Quran, interestingly, interestingly enough as well, which says that if you become a Muslim, whoever uh, repents and believes and does good works, then God with will, you Allahu sayyatihim hasanat, that God will change their bad deeds into good deeds so every how does that make you feel well yeah that's obviously fantastic to hear and good to know and um it's it's interesting because i've i've spent very little attention very little time paying attention to the negative comments yes. because i i don't in general mm. but on this particular subject a few people were forwarding me like the profiles of somebody or of the people who ha were unhappy with my conversion and they weren't living very Islamic lives themselves. So it's, exactly. kind of, it's kind of funny to look at, you know. Exactly, bro. I, I wanted to start with something which I think the whole world wants to, to hear about, which yep. is, and which, to be honest with you, affects our sector as people who want to speak about Islam, call people to Islam, defend Islam, have an Islamic voice or a voice for the Muslim people, which is your ban. Yep. Because quite frankly, I found it quite, it was a vicious attack, a brutal attack on you. It's a case study example now. They've put you in the history books. The question is, what grounds have all of these different social media organizations banned you? They, they never gave me grounds. They never mm. sent me an official email. They never gave me an official reason. They just delete your profile and uh, you just can't log in anymore. The reason they don't give you an official reason, I think, at the end is because they're scared in a court of law that they're going to be stuck to one reason, uh -huh. right? So if I decide to take them to court, they want to be able to flip-flop and make up reasons as they go. They want to change their terms of service and terms of conditions proactively. They want to change it afterwards. Um, so, it's this one here. Oh, that's one. I don't know what this is. It's not me. I don't know who this is. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. But Just, um, uh, put that. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, so they never gave me an official reason for banning me. Uh, yeah. so I don't truly understand and truly know. I mean, I can I understand the reason they've come up with. I know that reason is false. I have my own theories on why they banned me, mm. but them themselves have never told me why. They just delete I mean, your profile. For example, YouTube. Most people, producers, know that YouTube have community guidelines, right? right? And they have copyright strikes. So, for example, if one breaks the, the rules, if you like, of engagement, then they're given a strike, and then a second strike, and a you're telling me that this process was not taken with you? Oh, absolutely not. No, I had no strikes. Um, when I first got banned, the initial ban was on Meta. It was on Facebook and Instagram. In, in perfect synchronization was a large press release by the media, which gave this reason to justify 
banning me, which was, of course, false. And I knew the ban was coming. We can talk about that in a second. But when it first hit, mm. I then, by coincidence, got one strike on my YouTube channel. Which was it a community strike? It was some strike for some old video about me talking about masks, saying that masks were ridiculous, a COVID-19 okay. strike. Yeah. On a very old video, they gave me a strike, which obviously prevents you from posting for seven days. Yeah. So I filmed a reply to my initial ban, and then after five days, I think, as the strike was coming to an end, just before I could post, they deleted the whole channel without exp explanation, without an email, nothing, just deleted all of it, wiped it off. And, and the channel wasn't even in my name. This is what's funny about this. Yes, I was on the channel, but the channel was in the name of the producer. So it wasn't even officially my channel. Mm -hmm. My brother's channel got wiped. Like they just attack oh, and just oh. delete everything. And yeah, these community guidelines are so ridiculously vague that they don't even mean anything. Do trying, to, trying to read them is like reading garbage. It doesn't make any sense. I've been following the arguments online about this kind of thing. And obviously one of the key tenets, if you like, of Western civilization is freedom of expression and speech. Yeah. And the, the main counter argument is that, no, but YouTube and all these other companies, they're private companies. But why I would respond to that is that, well, these are private companies, but in many ways, they have a higher ability to uphold freedom of speech and expression than even the governments do. Yep. So this is actually very, it's like an Orwellian state. Like we're, we're looking at something which the thought police, isn't this concerning that you have these uh, elites, whoever they may be, who can take these arbitrary decisions and delete somebody from YouTube? Like yeah, that? it's worse than concerning. This is why I talk about the matrix all the time in my videos. Yeah. And I try and explain that we are living in a false version of reality. We're living in a computer generated simulation because mm. the computers, which is the social media companies, are generating a version of reality, which simply isn't true. By deleting one entire side of the argument, yeah. by purporting facts, facts, which happen to be false, by deleting information which happens to be true, yeah. by making sure the algorithms choose what information you see and what you don't see, mm -hmm. they're literally affecting the world people live in. And there's people who are walking through the world today with a mindset and a view on life, which is the result of false information, the result of a construction by these social media companies. So we're living inside of our matrix. We're living inside of a very false version of reality. And, and it's scary. Th and that's in many ways, it, it, it can be more pernicious than a, a, you know, a classic totalitarian state because at least with a totalitarian state, Everyone's being honest about their level of domination. With this kind of thing, it's like it gives you the illusion of freedom. Do what you want, but then we'll control the narratives in other ways. Yeah, exactly. And I, I also think in most totalitarian states, like I don't think freedom of speech exists anywhere on yeah. the planet. Yeah. But I do think inside of some states, you know what you can talk about and you know what you can't talk about. And it's pretty clear. Yes. Right. If I were to go to Russia, for example, mm. I would know what I could say and yeah. what I couldn't say yeah. without getting in trouble, right? Yeah. But in yeah. the Western world, we pretend that's not the case. And I think that often they'll let you discuss many different subjects until you get to a certain point of influence. And that's when they get afraid of you. It's not just what you say, it's how powerful your voice is. I think the biggest problem with me is not the things I was saying, it's the fact that I became so monumentally popular. Yes. And if you're monumentally popular and you have a huge proportion of the youth and a large contingent of the population which are interested in your words, and you haven't sold your soul to the agenda, then they see, okay, he's a, he's a large counteraction to our, our methods and what we're trying to do here, so he had to go. So I think also you can be the victim of your own success in the Western world. So let me ask you this final question on this point, which is, you call it the matrix, we can call it the liberal world order. Yeah. <laughs> because the double, LWO, or, yeah. or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it, it is it's certainly a, a method of control. They've got their own ideologies. You know, liberalism, for example, second wave feminism still, you know, they're, they're putting it, they're shoving it in our faces. Yep. And obviously you're, you know, you've said things which are totally antithetical to that, which in many ways could be argued to be the reason why they banned you, to be honest with you. Well, I, I'm, I'm against this whole idea of liberalism and tolerance as a whole, because mm. one, it's hypocritical because these people are not liberal and tolerant. Mm. The people who are talking about liberalism and tolerance, they want us all to look different, but think the same. If you think differently, then you're instantly a bad guy, right? You have, they love the idea of someone looking different so they can pretend they're d diverse and tolerant, yeah. but they want you to say the same things and believe the same things. Yeah, as soon yeah. as you step outside of their pre-approved script, instantly they're no longer tolerant and they no longer, they're no longer interested in diversity of thought. So the first thing, it's very hypocritical. And secondly, mm. I've learned in life that the easiest way to get people to accept bad things is to do it with a Trojan horse. You find some way to disguise it mm. Even the Senate does this. Even governments do this. Mm. They'll say, you know, the green bill, this is to save the environment. And then somewhere on page 84 will be this little code about giving them all a pay rise. You, and you don't want to look like the bad guy who yeah. says no to saving the environment. Yeah, cool. but, and they just sneak it in, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's very difficult. If you vote against saving the environment, you're terrible. And the media talks about how you didn't want to save the environment. That it, and you have to sit there and try and explain on page 84, the MPs are trying to get an extra 45% money. 
and it, and you're and you're already in on a back foot. And this is how they do it. They do everything with Trojan horses, and it doesn't matter what you want to name. Even agendas that are pure of heart, simple things, they end up being weaponized and Trojan, like you just said, second wave feminism and liberalism, all this crazy stuff. Mm. But the number one, mm. the number one most dangerous one is this idea of tolerance. Mm. To sit and talk about being tolerant sounds like such a good thing that it's very difficult for someone to sit and say, no, I am an intolerant person. Now you look bad. Mm. But when they say tolerance and push tolerance to the point where absolute degeneracy must be accepted, That's the point. Yeah. then then you're a, you're a better person <laughs> to not be tolerant. You can't be tolerant of degeneracy. You can't yeah. be tolerant of your own children seeing things they shouldn't see. You can mm. be tolerant of, of the destruction of society. Mm. If they're going to sit here and say that, no, tolerance is the best thing ever, and then Trojan horse it and, and, and destroy the way humans interact, mm. then I don't think tolerance is a good thing. Well, I mean, that's the thing. They've hijacked the phrase, and they've used it in their own context. Uh, there's, there's one particular political thinker, his name is Mombai. He says something very interesting. He says that the West has not acted morally consistent. They've only acted strategically consistent. Yep. And so it's, it's tolerance when it's within your own borders or within a certain subsect of people. But then it becomes uh, whatever it wants. It becomes uh, you know, a colonizing mission or a civilizing mission when it comes to you know, the Iraq war, for example. Completely. If you look at all of Western foreign policy, I mean, they'll talk about we need democracy, we care about freedom, they come up with all this garbage. But the truth is they'll support any side they want to su support regardless of whether they're democratic, regardless of what, what team they're on. They don't, they, like, you, you absolutely not only nailed it. It's just about st strategy at the time. Mm. And they have no true morals or true moral fiber. They'll just sit there and go, what's the strategical best decision? And they'll, and they'll get it done. And yeah, that's Western foreign policy. And I think it's the same across basically the entire Western world. But this idea, when I hear people talking about tolerance, yeah. it's just, an, when I hear it, I know what they're trying to do. Yeah. They're trying to say, this is evil, this is bad, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but you're intolerant because yeah. you don't like evil. And you have, there has to be a point where you stand up as a man and society stands up yeah. and says, yes, I'm intolerant of certain things. Mm -hmm. If someone broke into my house and tried to just start making <laughs> dinner, I, I'd be like, whoa, 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 who are you? Like, be tolerant. No, I will not be. Who the fuck is this guy? You know, like. It depends on what food is cooking. Right? Well, I, I mean, there has, to be, there has to be a line in the sand. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason they keep talking about tolerance, diversity, inclusion, mm. tolerance, 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 is not because they care about different people of different yeah. uh, races or different uh, beliefs. Uh, certainly not beliefs, because you're not allowed a different belief. Yeah, That's yeah. the number one thing. Yeah. But um, it's because they want you to just sit down and swallow the pill and allow yourself to be brainwashed and not stand up for anything. That's all they want. It's, it's not ironic that they use tolerance as a way to try and manipulate you completely that's what exactly what they try and do <laughs> yeah. in fact and you know it's funny i'm trying to think of an idea which is purported and accelerated by the mainstream media machine mm. that isn't an attempt on manipulation like yeah. every single thing that they they jump behind and they try so hard to get you to believe in mm. is a manipulation attempt yeah. i'm trying to think of one that isn't yeah, why else would they waste their screen time yeah. like you know they, they're, they're sitting there these people are smart enough to understand that the internet's coming and people are spending more time on independent medias and people are learning more information from each other and they're slowly I mean, we can, I don't want to go into the subject. We can talk about the last few years. They still have a grip on the world because they yeah. proved it, right? But with the, with, the, with the common cold. But still, they're sitting there going, okay, we have this mass media machine. The average person only watches six minutes of our propaganda a day. They can't waste those six minutes, my friend. Like, they need to go, what's our agendas? Let's get to the point. What do we need people to believe about X, Y, Z? They can't be sitting there telling us the truth. <laughs> that's, a, that's a total waste of time. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you now, because this is the hot topic, especially in the Muslim community, about your conversion. Yeah. So tell us the story. Like, what happened exactly? Well, I think a lot of people who've been following me for a while understand that I've been mm. very respectful of Islam for a long time. Yeah, sure. I was born in a Christian country. I was raised as a Christian. And I've always been very respectful of Islam. And... It's become more and more obvious to me and, and more and more pertinent that Islam is the last religion mm. on the planet. Mm. When I talk about Islam, because I'm new to it, yeah. I, I, I'm a little bit careful, right? Because I'm new to it. I'm certainly not a scholar. There's so much I need to learn. I know I'm on a learning journey. I'm not here to sit here and, and talk scripture. I, I don't know those things yet. I'm here to learn. Yeah. But and we're here at your assistance. Anything thank you, bro. Thank you. Honestly. Thank you. Yeah. But um, it's just for me, it feels like the last religion on earth. I feel like there's no other religion. People say to me, why did you convert? And I said, I don't really think, feel it as a conversion. I, it's almost like I knew God was real and now I've become religious. And they say, well, you were religious before. I was like, religious before how? Christian? Mm. What does Christian mean? Mm. 
Like, who's not a Christian? You go to Christian nations and everyone says they're a Christian. Look how they live their lives. Go yeah. into the average church. Is anyone actually fearful of God? Anybody? Mm -hmm. No. The girls are out on Saturday night drinking and then mm -hmm. they turn up to church because their parents made them. Mm -hmm. Like, there's, there's no substance to the religion. And also, Islam very closely reflects my personal beliefs. I, through my personal life, I've yeah. learned that if you don't have standards and you're not a strong person who's prepared to defend his ideas, you'll be crushed. Yes. And we look at most religions in the world today which are not prepared to defend their ideas. What's happened to them? They're just getting crushed. And yeah. now we have Christianity as an idea which has basically said, well, we can't set any firm rules because everyone will just quit. So instead, let's make it so easy to be a Christian that nobody has to put any effort in yeah. and then accept everybody no matter what. And hopefully we can keep the church doors open. <laughs> That's not, that's not yeah, God yeah. to me, you know? Yeah, yeah. God to me is, is strong. God to me is something to be feared. Yeah. God to me is something, someone that people are afraid to mock. Yeah. God to me is someone that you have to go out of your way to prove something to. God yeah. to me has red lines. Yeah. Like God to me re represents the Islamic faith. The Christian God to me, I don't see God. I, yeah. I can't explain. I don't see anything there. So yeah. to me, it was, it was the only logical choice wow. in the end. Alhamdulillah, man. I mean, many, as you're saying this, I'm sure many people are like ecstatic and extremely happy. It's a great, it's a great thing for everyone, honestly, because, you know, just anyone coming into Islam is, is you know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi told us better than the world and everything in it. Yeah. But imagine now somebody of major influence. I mean, you're the most Googled person on the planet. I'm not yeah. sure if you still have yeah. any top spot. I, th I think Putin might have beat me as of last week. But I think it's between me and Putin at the moment. <laughs> but I don't want to lose to Putin. Look, Putin's the big G. I don't want more enemies. Like it's it's fine, Vladimir. You can have it. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear you saying that statement. Yeah. Putin beat me last year. Right? Yeah, <laughs> last yeah. Week. I think we're just certainly the most Google. <laughs> but no, no, it's, it's, it's definitely something beautiful, and uh, a lot of people have. Uh, you know, you'll be surprised at how many women as well, like, because obviously the the accusations of misogyny and stuff, which yeah. you know, but but a lot of women, alhamdulillah, especially in the Muslim world, they're absolutely happy. In fact, let me tell you a story. Just before I came here today, one um, p one particular woman, I can't reveal her identity, but she's working as a school teacher yep. in London. And um, actually, my friend told me that she was uh, kicked out of school yep. because they had this campaign against you in the schools. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. I've seen, yeah, this was Are part of the cancellation. I did know about this. Yeah. yeah so in, in British schools, they, they said, you know, if you say anything good about if you if you say anything good about this person, or you have to be reported or prevent or anything, like that. and if you say anything, you, you know, you have to kind of combat his extremism or whatever it may be, right? So she, because when you became Muslim, she abstained from doing that. She said, I can't really do that because, yeah. you know, Islamic laws and it's, it's backbiting and he's got honor yeah. in Islam and so on. And unfortunately, they fired her from that, from the position. Wow. So you can see that this is the level of encroachment we're talking about here. So, uh, and this shows you that the level of fraternity that exists and not only the fact that, you know, when you're looking at Twitter or whatever, Twitter or whatever, social media, it's not a representation of what's really happening. On of the course, ground. of course. And I, I mean, that's that's crazy to hear. And what's most crazy is, yeah, the, the fervor behind this idea that I'm somehow extremist is truly it's truly clown world. Like I've sat as a professional and, and analyzed my content and understood which things can be taken out of context and which things were said in a way perhaps they wouldn't, shouldn't have been said before I was massively famous. But yeah. we have to sit here and understand that if you take anybody on the planet and give them seven years of YouTube and yeah. then they decide and they blow up big, you're going to be able to find 30 to 45 seconds of clip across all those years that can be taken out of context, right? Yeah. And, 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 and it's truly crazy because they sit and say, oh yeah, but you know, the young boys are watching your stuff and... They, they don't truly understand all of it, and it, there's nuance that's missing. And, and my argument is very simple. My argument is, well, one, you're taking small clips out of context. And two, there's not a single piece of content on the internet that a 14-year-old boy can't misunderstand. Name yeah. somebody, name someone who's producing content on the internet that you would be 100% I mean, happy now, for a 14-year-old to... Drill artists, and so they're saying... Uh, I mean, I live in an area that's... I'm not going to mention the names of the, the artists, but they're talking about going, going to this person's house and killing him. And killing him in the middle of a knife crime epidemic. Yeah. We have little Nas twerking on having sex with the devil in his music videos. Really? Like, we're going to sit here and talk about <laughs> how children can be Im impressionable young children, and I'm sitting there saying there's no way I'm the worst person on the internet. No, That's not why they deleted a, me. The difference for them is, as you've mentioned, on those on those fronts, it doesn't matter to them because it's like, okay, they, they're consuming our hedonistic product or whatever it is. That it doesn't change their worldview. Whereas what you're saying is ideological now. You're, ch you're challenging the status quo of the LW, of the liberal world order. You are challenging second wave feministic notions. You are challenging some liberal notions. You are challenging ideas, commonplace ideas of, of tolerance. And uh, George Orwell said it very well. He said that the more a society moves away from the truth, 
the more it hates people who speak it. Absolutely, and, and, you're, and you're right. And I think even the basic things I teach, because some people have said to me, Andrew, all you teach about is personal responsibility, motivation, working hard, getting up and doing the right thing. I said, that's the absolute, those are the things they're most afraid of. Mm. If you teach people to have standards for themselves and to be morally strong people and to know right from wrong, then they can't brainwash you. Yes. So that's what they're most afraid of. They're most afraid of young men waking up and going, no, I don't believe that. You have to believe it. No, I don't believe it. I don't want to. And I want to go do this. I want to go to the gym and be strong, or I want to believe X, or I want to be a moral person. They genuinely have a problem with baseline morality. Yes. Yeah. Understand, when uh, some people recognize when I convert to Islam that there was a time I was an atheist. There was a time when I was atheistic. Mm. And the reason I am now so absolutely certain that God is real is because yeah. I've seen evil. I've seen shaitan. I've seen it. When you see enough evil, you realize that there must be an equal and opposite force. And there are people out there in the world today doing the work of the devil, genuine demons, who are trying to destroy the baseline morality that's inside of all of us. We're all born with some kind of morality, and they're trying to destroy it. And that's exactly the Islamic understanding, that, that we believe that you're born with something called fitrah, which is the initial goodness. You're, you're, you're born with an innate belief, receptivity to believe in one God. Yeah. And then that is corrupted. In fact, there's a prophet, uh, hadith of the prophet, where he says, "Kullu mauludin yuladu al fitra." Every born child is born upon this initial goodness. And then his father and mother, or his parents, they socialize him into, you know, Christianity, Judaism, yeah. Magiism. So the idea is that everyone is born with this initial. Uh, goodness and this initial uh, will or want to believe in God, one yeah. God, and then as you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's what you're mentioning here is really is profound because you're you're, you're mentioning a, a central doctrine in Islam. But but it's and 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 this is why perhaps I f I found God the way I did because mm. I understood all these things mm. first and then I saw the Quran and it confirmed so many things for me. You know, mm. like I've the, even the conversations I've been having so far, so many things have been confirmed and it's amazing the knowledge that's inside of it, which is so applicable today. Yeah. yeah. For 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 an old book, right? You know, it's supposed to be old, but it seems yeah. so so timeless. But it's truly amazing. But you're you're totally right. And. And the baseline morality, I don't think most people understand that when they're doing this under the guise of tolerance, when they're saying be so tolerant that you no longer believe in right from wrong, they're not doing that to make society a better place. They're doing that to empty your brain so that you have no resistance to the slave mind programming. They want to yeah. get you to a point where if they tell you the sky is green, yeah. you look at it with your own eyes yeah, and yeah. you see blue, but no, the sky is green. That's what they want so that you have to have nothing in your brain that can prevent that. If you have God... If you have, no, I believe this is right point. and wrong. Yeah, if yeah. you have personal responsibility, if you have self-accountability, mm -hmm. if you're a person who sticks up for what he believes, all that's bad to them. They want all of that gone yeah. so they can tell you the sky is green. Mm -hmm. And and I don't want to say too much because I don't want the stream to end, but they're going to tell you something much worse than the sky is green. They're going to tell you something else. And and it's, they're trying to program us all into slaves. And it's I, scary. I remember when I was in my undergraduate days and I was uh, reading a particular book by this guy called Jeremy Bentham who became like, you know, the spiritual forefather of J.S. Mill, who is the father of like social liberalism of today. And I remember reading this because it was so powerful because it linked to something I read in the Quran. He said that, you know, you have two gods. He said, you have the God of pain and you have the God of pleasure. And I thought, this is so interesting. The Quran states, you know, have you seen the one who takes his own desires as a God? Yeah. And because now there is no transcendental force that we can look up and, and as you say, venerate. Now we're forced to be slaves to the system, yeah. we're, uh, to our own desires, or, I mean, the Quran has another verse which I think is so powerful and it connects very well with what you're saying. It says, God darab Allahu mathalan, rajulan, that God has struck a parable of a man. Fihi shuraka mutashakisuna, that he's got many different slave owners. Wa rajul, salaman li rajulin, and another kind of man who's only got one slave owner. He's, God is basically telling us in the Quran that you've got w one example of one individual who's got multiple slave owners and another one with just one. He says, Are they the same? So here, the idea is, as Rousseau said, he's a liberal philosopher, he said that mo man is born free but everywhere in chains. This is the order because if you don't have that God to, to worship, then you're going to end up having to worship to everything else. And the whole part of the shahada which you took, which is ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu an Muhammad rasulullah, the, 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 the true meaning of that, la ilaha illallah, is that there is no God worthy of worship except for one God. Yep. Which means that your, des your desires or the system or these people that want to control us, 
they are, the problem is they're not worthy of worship. The only one worthy of our sub subordination and submission is the creator of the heavens and the earth. There's no one else. I agree, and it's, 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 I, I completely agree, and I've agreed with this for the longest time. You know, I've never been to like a music concert, mm. and people ask me why, and I said, I just look at it and I feel embarrassed. I look at someone up on a stage <laughs> dancing around and I look at hundreds of thousands of peasants in the crowd <laughs> just yeah 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 I'm like uh, it's embarrassing I'm I feel cringe it's like secondhand embarrassment when I see these festivals and everyone's losing their mind or these music concerts I genuinely feel embarrassed for the people who go because to me that is a form of worship like yeah you can listen to the music at home for free you like you don't have to wait in that line and stand out in the cold like I I don't know perhaps it was a bit extreme but I've always known that they're trying to give us false idols to some degree. And when I speak to atheists, atheists, they go, oh, I don't believe in God. But they, they've signed up so hard to the liberal woke agenda. They're yeah. as religious as anybody, but they're just believing in the wrong things. They're believing in degeneracy and they're believing in the work of the devil. So humans always need something to believe in. And it's a great thing you said about your own desires. It's like it's one, one guy I was talking to since my conversion says, it's interesting that somebody with everything, all the Western world, yeah, everything, yeah. everything somebody w could want exactly. has now converted. And I said, yeah, because even before my conversion, I understood that hedonism is a black hole mm. and you can never fill it. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be able to have enough girls to be happy with girls. You're never going to be able to have enough money to be happy with money. You're never yeah, going to yeah. be, be able to, you know, drink enough to be happy with drinking. Like it's a black hole and you can pour endless things down it, but you'll never fill it up. And you need to have some degree of self-restraint. And I've always been a very disciplined person. I've never made mistakes, but certainly, yeah, the higher power is, is, is going to give you more satisfaction in your heart than endless, I, endless insanity. Absolutely. Because I did see a clip of you um, ma making the same points. You were saying that, you know, I've done all of these things. Because the accusation is, well, you are the poster child of hedonism, right? Let's say this guy, what, this, you're talking about which, which before, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. But th what's annoying about that is I'm absolutely not. That's yeah. what's that's what's so annoying about that yeah, because yeah. I know so many people of my net worth. I will sit here and say, on the podcast before everybody and, and before God, voila, voila. <laughs> yeah. Never, never slept with a prostitute or paid for sex in my life. I don't gamble. I've never taken a drug in my life, never tried steroids, never tried weed, never tried cocaine ever sure in my life, that, yeah. ever. <laughs> never, never, never. Yeah. Like, I drank a bit of alcohol, okay. smoked some shisha, smoked some cigars, and spent most of my life as an athlete, yeah. working hard, 12, 14-hour days, making money. But I look after my family. But so for me to be, but yeah, it, yeah. they go, you're the poster boy of hedonism. I say, yeah. I know so many people who do so much worse than yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I really don't do that much. But I'm Andrew, not gambling. Andrew, from our perspective, if you've done all of that, your, your, your slate is clean. Which is, which is amazing. But it's just, in, it's just incredible to me that especially at my level of net worth, right? I, I, I grew up in Luton poor on a council estate yeah, and, yeah. That, and now I'm pretty financially successful. And once yeah. you get past this, this line and you meet these other people who are, who are, as, who are as rich as I am, yeah. yeah, they go, they get a boat, they put a hundred girls on it who are paid for, you know, a big pile of cocaine. That I, I don't do any of them things. Like yeah. I, I would, I'd stand by and say I'm one of the, for a man with a bunch of money from a council estate, I'm, I'm as pretty behaved as you can possibly hope yeah. for. So, no, I, I feel that in you. Obviously, you, you were in your previous life, you, you were the champion, world champion in kickboxing. That, yeah. that requires a certain level of restriction, discipline, and these kinds of things. I, I do think that this is kind of like a misconception. Yeah. I mean, people think that you're, it's part of your marketing. It's probably uh, self induced marketing. It's part of your marketing engineering strategy that you've, you've, you've engineered yourself as, you know, this is, this is my life. But in reality, though, is it fair for me to say that if something doesn't have proper meaning and purpose for you, you won't really enjoy it. Yeah, I think a lot of people, in fact, the number one thing I hear from people who meet me in person is, I've had so many people meet me and they're like, you surprised me. I'm like, why? They're like, you just, you're just working, you just sit on your phone or you just work on your laptop and, you know, like they thought I'd be this crazy guy running around being crazy and they realize I'm extremely restrained. Yeah. I, I, I'm very careful about everything I do. From what's, the food. what's your routine like? Okay, so it's a good question. So yeah. I wake up, whatever time that happens to be. I don't, I, well, what, time, what time do you wake up? I have a problem sleeping. Okay. I'm not good at sleeping. I really struggle with it. So yeah. I, I can maybe get five to six hours a night, maybe. And okay. the reason I can't sleep is because if my brain is even semi-conscious, yeah. I'm thinking of a work or some problem I have to fix. And then I end up on my phone and then I can't sleep. That's yeah. how it works. So mm -hmm. I can give perfect examples. Like there's even, even before this podcast, I knew I had to be up 
I had to go to doctors at eight and then I had to come to this podcast. So I said last night, let me try and go to bed a little bit early. I tried to go to bed at 11 and then I woke up to go toilet at 2.25 a.m. And then I was thinking about some construction in my house in Romania and some invoices that I hadn't seen yet. And then mm -hmm. by the time I messaged my assistant, that it, now I'm awake. Yeah. So now I've been awake since two. Like they, yeah. I just, I can't turn my brain off. I struggle with it, right? Yeah. So I'm not good at sleeping, but let's say I wake up around nine-ish, okay. but I go to bed usually around three, four. Yeah. Uh, first thing I do is drink two liters of water. Then I train. Every day I train for about what thir do you do? I train for about thirty to forty-five minutes a day. I don't and train. What what is it? What kind of training is it? It depends where I am because I travel so much. Right, right. So if I'm in the if I'm in hotels, you kind of got to do what you can do, right? Okay. So mainly it's weights now. Um, mm. I, I don't box as often because it's it's inconvenient. Like if I was training for a fight, it's different. Yeah. And I was sparring a couple of days ago. I still got the move. No one can hit me, so I still got it. Yeah. But um, yeah, so usually about 45 minutes, I, 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 I tear through a bunch of weights. I just mm. go as crazy as I can, get that out of the way. Yeah. Bunch of coffee. I'm a coffee addict, I guess. I don't know if that's still allowed. I hope so. Hey, but um, okay, good. Because uh, I love caffeine. I believe caffeine's a miracle drug. So I'll have two or three coffees and another two liters of water. I only eat dinner every day. I don't eat breakfast. I don't eat lunch. Yeah. And then from there, it's just completing tasks. I have something to do. I have a podcast with you to do, yeah. or I have somewhere to go, yeah. or I have to go. Maybe sometimes it'll be something good, like pick up a new car or a new watch. Yeah. But if not, I, tell, I promise you now, I spend every waking second on my laptop or staring at my phone running the empire. That's all I do is work. Mm -hmm. Life to me is work. Life to me is work at the point now, sleeping's work. I only sleep because if I don't sleep, I wouldn't be able to work. Wow. If I could work without sleeping, I wouldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, people look at my life and they, especially you're right with the marketing, they see the cars, they see the boats, they see girls, et cetera. And they're like, oh wow, he's living this crazy life. And then they get around me and realize that, yeah, we're on a boat. Yeah, there's hot girls. Yeah, it's a yacht, but I'm on my laptop and I'm working. That, that's it. That's all I want to do is run the empire because it gives me, it gives me a sense of purpose. So mm -hmm. it sounds boring to say, but all I do is work, my friend. That's it. Wow. That's it. For, when I finish this, We'll talk, we'll have a bit of food, et cetera. I'll yeah. get in the car, I'll go back, and I will work until my next appointment. That's it. I just work. That's all I mm -hmm. do. So it's, and it's kind of funny because people say to me, like, what's the secret to getting rich? And I'm like, it's easy if you, if you don't do anything else but work. Like, yeah. I don't have any, my only, like, I'm trying to think of what even, even hobby I have. I love to what, drive. What is the secret of getting rich? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. We, we live in an attention economy. Yeah. So I think stage one is certainly attention. Mm. Stage two is once you have that attention, establishing credibility. Yeah. And then stage three, once you've established a credibility, is finding a way to genuinely improve people's lives. Mm. The reason I do so fantastically well is because everybody who's ever followed me or tried any of the things I talk about, yeah. their life gets better. Yeah. So it's very easy to say, oh, I've tried Tate's program and my life's better. Or I tried this, I followed Tate and I feel happier. So then, yeah. of course, they're going to understand the brand and that's the way to do it. But but truly, it's it's hard work. You need to be able to work endless hours. It's extremely competitive. Mm. You need to be able to work as har harder than the other guys. And that's the only way I did it. I ground to the top the old-fashioned way and that's still what I do. I just work. So with, with this, basically, I'll say that, you know, uh, in terms of your routine, Islamically, the main thing to focus next on will be the prayers, yes. five prayers yep, a day, yep. right? And so that's obviously one in the morning, and then you, you'll have, like, prayer times and stuff like yep. that, where you have to do the ablution and learn to... You, I saw you kind of praying that was... Yes, the yeah, that was I'm, more, I'm learning it, and yeah, and I've been told the times, and I've got all this, and I'm, I'm going through all that, and I have to incorporate that as well. It gives you a solid structure. I feel like it gives you anchorage in the day. It's the spine of my personal day. I feel like, you know, it's... it's it just creates that structure in the day. Yep. And it's a spiritual thing. I mean, even the prayer itself, when one prays and they say Allahu Akbar, which is Allah is the greatest. Some yep. people think it's some kind of war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do it in war as well. I mean, to be fair. But they say Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is greater than everything else, this whole world and everything in it. And then when they start engaging in prayer, then what you're doing is you're trying to, in a sense, get out of the zone of being in this world, connect with God, ask God for guidance. And we do that very consistently because... We feel like, I mean, the, the belief is that guidance is in God's hands, yep. you know, and so doing that, if, you know, spiritually cleansing, it's, for me, it's the most important thing that one can do in the whole day. So that, in terms of your structure, that would be the thing that you'd put in next. But I wanted to ask you about something else now, which I think is something you're known for as well, yep. in terms of uh, speaking about these things, is your gender positions, okay? So this is, what, you know, a lot of people have controversy with you, yep. uh, accuse you of misogyny and all these kinds of things. Yep. I mean, what are, let's, let's say now, what maybe as after you've become Muslim or even before, what are your views on gender? Like, how would you summarize your views on gender? I would summarize my views on gender by being very simple and stating the fact that I think that the genders are different. 
I think we have different strengths and weaknesses. I think men are better at some things than women. I think yeah. women are better at some things than men. Yeah. I think when we work together as a team, yeah. that makes us the most powerful force on the planet. I think the biggest problems with the world today is that everybody is trying to pretend that they're interchangeably as good as mm -hmm. each other at, yeah, at yeah. the same things. Yeah. And that's destroying the teamwork. It's very simple. If I was an accountant and I met a tailor, I'd say, okay, you make the clothes. I'll do the accounting. Mm -hmm. And then as a team, we have a, a very profitable business, right? Yeah. If, if we were to turn up and we were to decide, you know what, I'll do half the accounting and you do half the accounting. Yeah. And you do half the tailors and I do half the tailors. Where our tax bill will be a mess. The jackets won't fit. <laughs> like it'll all fall apart. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it's so confusing for people to sit there and understand and go, yeah, women have certain strengths and weaknesses. Men have certain strengths and weaknesses. And when we both understand them, both accept them mm -hmm. and work as a team, then we're a complete package. And this is why God created us to be different. Absolutely. If we were exactly the same, we wouldn't need each other. Yeah. This is what makes us need That's each other. Powerful yeah. Yeah. This, this is exactly why we need each same. other. We wouldn't need each other. That's yeah. right. And this is what people don't understand when they say I'm misogynistic or I say yeah. bad things. I'm like, no, absolutely not. I'm talking about the differences between men and women. So people understand that men need women and women need men. And that's what creates beautiful families. That's what keeps society functioning. And as soon as you point out the differences between the two genders, they're going to attack you because they don't want men and women to need each other. That's, yeah. they, that's one of the things they really don't want because the number one thing that will inspire you to resist against total tyranny is protection of your family. Yeah, yeah. They don't want the family unit in terms of the nuclear family because otherwise when they come to your door, the, devil, the devils and the demons, you're going to stand up and say, no, my wife and children are inside. Yeah. They don't want that. They want you to just be hedonistic and not really have anything of value and nothing worth fighting for and defending because then you'll accept the slave program and accept whatever they want you to do. But yeah, my, my views on gender are very, very simple. I think that we're, sli we're slightly different, but together we're ultimately powerful. And pointing that out has somehow labeled me negative by this vocal minority of psychopaths. And it, it truly, and I say psychopaths because they truly are. <laughs> they're, they're psychopaths, yeah, these yeah. people. They're truly destructive. And when I look at the, the people who have the most hate for me, Mm. who say I'm the most detrimental to women. Mm. If I look at their lives, none of them are happily married. Mm. A lot of them aren't even into women. They swing a completely different direction. Like these people, why are you pretending you care about a masculine man's views on females? Why do you pretend you care when I say I want to protect and provide for my woman? I, if she doesn't want to work, she doesn't have to work. I'll take care of her in that way and she'll take care of me in another way. Why are you pretending that offends you when your relationship with women in your own personal life doesn't even exist? And if it does, it's awful. I, I, I'll tell you what's going to happen now. As we're, we're as we're agreeing and talking now, some some people, especially some you know fe feminist uh, uh, people that are influenced by feminism within the Muslim community, say, "Look, this is exactly what we fear." Yeah. He's not holding him to account. You know, he's not speaking to him about the wild statements. And yeah. uh, the truth is, I'll say this: I don't actually feel like I uh, need to judge you because, quite frankly, Allah has already wiped away your sins. Yeah. Any statement that you made before about women or any thing that you've done with women before, once again. It's not my business to uh, judge you upon that. Yep. So that should be the Islamic position. However, let's say for the wider community, sure. right? Because at the end of the day, you know, we do want you to kind of not reintegrate, especially not in the matrix. Now, alhamdulillah, you're out of the matrix, let's yep. say, fully, fully out of it. Uh, Islam is totally out of the matrix. That's why they hate it so much. Yep. Uh, some of the comments that you've made, I haven't got a list of them. What are some of the comments that they accuse you of making and what is the context of these comments? Yeah, so the two that they accuse me of most is yeah. where I said a woman is a man's property, which okay. is the first one. Yeah. And the second one that they try and get me with is where I said a woman should bear some responsibility for being sexually assaulted. Okay. That's, and okay. both of them are massively taken out of context. Okay. I like to explain them. Right. When I said about a woman being a man's property, I was talking about the idea of biblical marriage at the time, Christian marriage. I was saying okay. that the man walks, the, the father walks the bride down the, down the aisle, yeah. gives her to the groom, she takes his last name, yeah. and he is now responsible for protecting and providing for her till death do them part. Yeah. She joins his family, right? Yeah. She yeah. belongs to him. Yeah. Oh no! That, so you're saying she's property? I'm saying she belongs to him. All right. So it's a semantical issue. What you're, what it's you're. It's a semantic issue. Correct. Yeah. So you're not necessarily saying that he can buy and sell her. Absolutely not. I'm okay. saying that he is responsible for her, and Fine. he must protect and provide for her. That's the, that's this one. But that's, I never yeah. even said the word property. They said the word property at me. Really? Right. So I yeah. said that she belongs because to him. Because the, the the exchange I saw is with between you and Piers Morgan. Oh yeah. And he was just being obnoxious. I, I don't even know how. He, you can see the man was insecure. Yeah. I, that's what, how I psychoanalyze him. I'm not you know, a psychiatrist, but I think he's just insecure. He felt like he had something to prove. He was, you know, he's of a certain age, of a certain weight. 
a certain disposition. Yeah. And, you know, there's people, when they see you and him together, that's enough of a victory for you and enough of a loss for him just to see you, do, you know, side by side. But as his face was becoming red like Peppa's Peppa Pig and he was getting more and more angry and interjecting every second, um, you know, he was mentioning these points. This is the only thing that, from my perspective, I felt, okay, maybe he has a point here. Sure. But as you've explained it, if you mean by property, X, Y, and Z, we don't actually mean property then, then potentially we say, look, you know, this is not the best wording. Yeah. You know, it's not the best wording. Absolutely. You know, and what you didn't mean by that is, you know, she's uh, some kind of commodity and ob object. Correct. Absolutely not. In fact, quite the opposite. I was trying to say how important she is and how she must be protected and provided for. Okay. And it was taken completely out of context and weaponized against me. And it's very similar with the other comment, the other comment of how women should bear some personal responsibility for being sexually assaulted. I'm not saying in 100% of cases that sexual assault uh, couldn't have been prevented. I'm not saying sexual assault should happen. In fact, I'd argue that I'm more strict on the idea of rape than the laws. I think these people should be executed. I think it's yeah. disgusting, completely yeah. and utterly yeah. disgusting. However, I think it is asinine for us as a society to sit here and pretend that if a woman goes out takes drugs with a man she doesn't know, yeah. goes to his house without telling her brother or her father or telling anybody, and puts herself in a position of absolute vulnerability that she has zero responsibility. So now, I'm, I'm not, yeah, yeah, it, sh yeah. it shouldn't happen to her. Of course, of course. It's disgusting. Yeah, of course. But also, I shouldn't get robbed if I walk down the street with a million dollars in the middle of the night. So but, what, it but it can, what, so I must think ahead. What, you know? you're, what you're effectively saying is uh, that, you know, if there are certain situations where the probab probability of sexual assault for women increase. In fact, for example, the WHO itself, yeah. I was looking at, they had this whole, probably the most uh, compendious thing on, uh, on rape and sexual assault, and they were talking about different countries, and th the one thing that they said, which the West has more than other places, is stranger rape. And, the, and actually, one of the reasons why, could very well be because of this culture of intoxi intoxication, yeah. of clubbing and these kinds of things, so it increases the probability, I think, it's a very reasonable argument to say, well, this increases the possibility of stranger rape. Now, obviously, they're going to come back and say, but the way you said it... Of course they're going to do it. It's victim blaming. But they're going to they're yeah. say it's victim blaming, and they're saying I'm going to be advocating for rape, and they're going to be saying yeah, well, I said it's okay, yeah, which is all garbage. It's all nonsense. Yeah. I'm trying to explain yeah. to people in a very realistic fashion that we live in a world which is not ideal. We live in a world where everybody understands that stealing is wrong, but some people still steal. This is why we lock our cars and lock our houses. Absolutely. This is why we protect our certain assets and our money. This is why I will not walk down the street with a gold watch in London at three in the morning by myself, because I don't want to put myself in a position where there's a higher probability of something bad happening to me. Yeah. And I'm just saying that when it comes to this one particular crime, mm. because it's so heinous, and it is heinous, absolutely, and certainly every perpetrator should face the absolute full punishment from not only the law, but God himself. But they sit and pretend that the, there's zero personal responsibility involved. And I'm just saying that there are some scenarios, not all, but yeah. in some scenarios, the woman has made it so easy for something bad to happen to her. And I'm saying we should teach them not to do that so that we can protect them. And the reason this whole subject came up is because I was talking about if I'm a man and I'm responsible for my woman and I want to protect her, and, there, and, we, and somehow we got on the subject of rape, and this was on a, a podcast three or four years ago. I said, the number one way I can protect my woman besides being beside her is teaching her to make smart decisions when I'm not around and making sure she's smart and doesn't put herself in bad positions. And this feminist was saying, yeah, but people shouldn't rape. I was like, I agree. People shouldn't steal. People shouldn't do a lot of things. But you still have to protect yourself and have some personal responsibility. And the feminist's argument against it was that, no, we need to teach men not to rape. Some asinine, idealistic, fairy tale land where we're going to go around and convince every man on earth to never rape again as if we haven't been trying to convince people not to steal since the dawn of human time it's yeah. stupid i think at the, at the base of what you're saying is basically a concern that look if you follow this advice you'll get the best results it's very very pragmatic advice absolutely but what is being twisted as us actually this guy is a misogynist which by the way the definition of they haven't even agreed on correct and this guy believes x y and z and they taking you out of context the, the problem here is for, for example, with rape, actually, interestingly, I was looking at, I was speaking to a lawyer. I'm not sure if the case is still the case in the UK, yep. but I don't think you can actually be convicted of rape if you're a woman to a man. I, I think only a woman can be convicted. Uh, it, yeah, uh, which is uh, funny uh, enough. Of, of Another thing that was interesting rape, when yeah. I was arguing this point, yeah. I was arguing it saying, listen, you've made this a gendered argument because you're a feminist. 29% mm. of, of rape cases in the in UK are male, male on male. Mm. And I'll say the same thing to a man. Don't go, do drugs, become intoxicated, go back home with someone you don't know, and put yourself in a position to be raped, stabbed, killed, murdered. 
whatever it is, right? And, and, and the feminists who were arguing against me goes, oh, but you don't understand male privilege. You get to walk around safe at night without worry. I was like, listen, my dear, you have no idea what it is to be a man. You have no idea. You think a man, you think we walk around London in the middle of the night f willy nilly without, with, with no concerns? They will kill us yeah, for the piece of metal on our wrist. <laughs> like, you think we're just walking around thinking doop de doo? No. Absolutely not. Yeah. I'd actually argue that in certain scenarios, in yeah. certain places in the Western world, it's more dangerous to walk alone as a man than a, than a woman. Yeah. You know, so it's it's absolutely asinine. They have this idealistic worldview that everything's perfect for men and everything's men's fault and women have no personal responsibility. And no matter what a woman does, there's no way she could be possibly involved, even 1% her fault at all. Yeah, but and, and on this point of the, the legalistic distinction, for example, if a woman cannot rape a man, but she can sexually assault him, but she cannot quote unquote rape him, for example, UK law, why are the feminists not arguing for equal rights on this point? Because uh, feminists don't want equal rights. Yeah, it's, it's not equal rights. It's just it's, what we want is we want equal, we want entitlement. It's an entitlement uh, scheme. But the point is really, I think you, you are a proponent, proponent of traditional family, aren't you? Absolutely. At, at the heart of it, you've always said that, despite everything else. Absolutely. I'm a proponent of traditional family and I'm a proponent of traditional. Polygamy as well? Yeah, well, I'm a proponent of traditional roles. Yeah. And the reason, the reason for this is because I actually think it makes humanity the most competitive. Yeah. I think that the world functions best and we're the most competitive as a species the closer we are to our original natural gender roles. And I think if you were to take 10 men and 10 women, yes. let's, let's say we have two planes, right? Both, yeah. both have 10 men, 10 women, both crash on an island. And if you had 10 men and 10 women who fell into their gender roles and the women started you know, foraging and the men started hunting and building and the women you know, made blankets and the men found animals to kill and we fell into our gender roles, and then you have the other island where all 10 of them, it's all mixed up and everyone just does whatever they decide. And, not, you know, I don't have to do that because I'm a man. You do it, etc. I feel like the island where people fall to their gender roles are yeah. more likely to succeed. I think if you go to. Right. Yeah, I think if you go to societies where life is much more difficult than it is for us because we live blessed lives, they are very, very ingrained to their gender roles because they understand the only way they can survive as a tribe or a species is to for the men to do X and the women to do X. We both do what we're good at. And this makes us the most competitive. And I feel like if you want to have a stable society and a competitive society, and when I say competitive, I mean competitive in all realms, including safety, including having as many children as possible, not even competitive in a combative sense. I'm just talking about having enough kids to beat the reproduction rate, which we're failing to do in the West, and everyone being able to walk around without getting hurt. I think the way to do that is to be in, inside of our gender roles. I think yeah. that's the way it is. And I, I was grew up, I mean, I tell you, I grew up in a, in a place where the world was very different. I'm not even that old. I was 35, but I grew up in a completely different world. Like if, if a random man, a stranger, a neighbor yelled at me as a kid, my dad would be like, yeah, yell at him. Like we were scared of our elders. Like my, my dad went to work. My mom cooked and cleaned like, and looked after us, us kids. Like I grew up in that world and people now are just trying to completely throw it out the window and they seem surprised that society's falling apart in front of our very eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know there's a verse in the Quran that actually says something quite similar to what you're saying. It says, do not wish what the other one has. For a man is a portion from what he has earned. And for a woman is a portion from what, her, what she has earned. And Allah min fadli and ask God from his bounty. Meaning, do not attempt to encroach on the other person's role. Yeah. Like men have been given certain things that women have not been given and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting that you talk about this um, case study example of uh, islands because quite frankly, I was looking at some uh, statistics and from the 1960s where the second wave um, feministic movement became very widespread until now, there's, there's been studies that have been done. The biggest one is one called Blanche Flower and Os Oswald, which happened between the years 1970 to 1990. It was a longitudinal study. And you'd expect that after all the implementation of, um, you know, legislative change and stuff like that in America and the UK uh, and elsewhere in the West, that, you know, women will be having a better life and that they'll be enjoying their times. But the conclusion of the study after they've interviewed 100,000 women, this is the biggest study that I think has ever been done, wow. 100,000 women wow. in both the UK and the US. The conclusion was that women have a deteriorated um, uh, you know, uh, situation. And in fact, even like the heads or the mothers of second wave femi men feminism, like Betty Friedan, who wrote The Feminine Mystique, and others, even uh, Jermaine Grimm, in 1963, she wrote the book uh, Feminine Mystique. And then afterwards, she wrote another book, which people don't study in schools. She said it herself. Wow. She, uh, she wrote a, a book called The Second Stage. She said, I'd done uh, sociological experiments in the 70s, after the 60s, after the changes that have been done in the 60s, and I found that in the 70s, women were more 
uh, depressed. Yep. One third of women, she states this in her own book, she says that one third of women were worse off. It, it was really interesting. There, there was actually a, um, a, a magazine, very famous magazine that done a poll on women. And they said, it's called Top Sartre Magazine. And they found that 79% of women that responded said that they uh, would quit work if they could tomorrow. Yep. 80% said that work is causing them psychological pain and distress. Yep. So in other words, this whole idea of prioritizing careers over motherhood and over being a wife and stuff like that, the experiment has already been done in a sense. Absolutely. And it's been done for the last you know, 60, 61 years, or 62 years, let's say since 63. And in that time, what we found has been a tremendous failure. Of course. Which has impacted women's mental health, their physical health, it's impacted families. One more thing I will say is that I was talking to one guy who's like, he's done um, demographic stuff called Nicholas Wolfinger. Yeah. And he, I asked him what families are most stable or whatever, yeah? Uh, by way of like the children turn out to be mo most, um, yeah. you know, educated, and they're away from delinquency and criminality, these kinds of statistics. He actually said religious families, like obviously nuclear, fa traditional families, religious yeah. families. So we have the data to show that families that take this traditional uh, role are clearly advantaged. They advantage women, yep. they advantage children, they advantage men. Absolutely. So it is the model. And now you're saying something which is against it. Clearly, it's not in their economic interest. Yep. And so is it the case that because of this, they're canceling you? Yeah, I, it's because I think it's because I'm trying to stick up for the, the baseline morality of humanity. It's interesting what you just said earlier as well from the Islamic point of view that we're born with an innate good and an innate understanding. Yeah. I think that women innately maybe the world has convinced them otherwise, but yeah. from my experiences, the Absolutely. only thing that satisfies them is becoming a mother. Absolutely. And nothing else is gonna fill that hole in your heart. No amount of sex in the city, Starbucks, makeup, Instagram likes, career, all this crap. There's a reason you are sad. And the reason you are sad is because you should have been a mother eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is why you feel miserable inside. And this is something that females are born innately with and society is trying to convince it out of them. And that's why you have so much confusion uh, in the world today. And like you said, this is why they ended up being un less happy after this liberation than they were before. And I'm not saying that women shouldn't have free choice. I think women should absolutely be allowed to do whatever they want. But they should sit and understand that this, the matrix and the system, the propaganda machine that they're sitting and digesting is trying very hard to convince them to move away from their natural instincts. When you sit and watch Sex in the City about some 49-year-old woman with no kids who's having a great time and is 0% depressed on her 58th fucking dude that month, <laughs> and you're sitting there watching it, they are trying to program you. And most women don't realize the level mm. of propaganda they're, they're existing under. Mm. This also goes back to the earlier point I made yeah. about Trojan horses because this is how they do everything. Feminism was about give the women the vote, right? Mm. Then they sneak in all this other insanity. Let's not allow women to have kids. Let's try and convince them not to. Let's convince women not to respect their man and make him feel like a man in his own household. Yeah. Let's convince women that they can physically attack a man on the street and they have no disadvantage at all because they're just as strong as a man is. Yeah. Let's convince women of this insanity, but we'll Trojan horse it in with feminism. So if you say, well, I'm against feminism. Oh, you don't want women to vote? No, no. It's the same thing they did with the Green New Deal, right? We want to save the planet and sneak the money in. Mm. So you have to also understand, and I wish people were more perspicacious that could understand that any agenda that the mainstream media is purporting, any agenda they're trying to make you swallow, yeah. there are hidden agendas and hidden back doors in all of it. Yeah. There always will be. And it doesn't matter whether it's a passport for a particular injection. Mm. It doesn't matter if it's uh, ideolog ideology. It doesn't matter what it is. They're trying to give you the surface level understanding that you can't disagree with mm. so that all the things you don't like come in. Right? And, and that's the scary thing about that. A lot of it is just a simple explanation that it's in the economic interest of the West and the elites. And it's no coincidence that second wave feminism really took off after World War II, where the infrastructure of these countries was damaged, and these guys were bringing immigrants from uh, all those countries now that, you know, that's why we've got so many immigrants and some so-called immigrants, people from abroad, ex-colonies or whatever, in the UK or whatever yeah. it is. They needed women in the workforce, so this was a convenient ideology, but which has now taken a Frankenstein form, and which has endangered women, endangered children, put women and children both in a very bad predicament, you're saying something opposite to this. They're saying if this guy gets too popular, we're going to lose money. Oh, completely. It's, it's, and it's not even just lose money. I think it's, I think it's more sinister than that. I think yeah. it's they're going to lose influence. And yeah. influence is the number one thing they care about. The reason that they push feminism so hard, a lot of people understand, is so they could double the tax bracket. They wanted women to work so they could double the taxes. Mm. But I think the other reason they did it that a lot of people don't consider is that in the w modern world, in the world you live in today, in the West, 
you don't raise your children and you don't own your children. You've had these children, I like to believe, because you're in love with your partner and you want to replicate yourself and purport your worldviews. And the way you view the world, you want that to be instilled in this child. That's not the case. They wanted the woman at work because if the woman's at home, she likely agrees with the worldviews of her man. And that means the children are being raised by the mother and they're likely to adopt those worldviews. In the modern world where they convince a woman to get a job, the man to get a job, they inflate the currency so nobody can exist any other way because it's too expensive. The parents are out working all day. The school and the internet and the matrix raise your children. Your children go to school all day mm. and be told things that you may not want them to learn. Yeah. Then they sit on the internet and read things and watch things you may not want them to watch. Yeah. You talk to them for 10 minutes at the end of the day and they go to bed. You're fighting with your 10 minutes against endless hours of the most entertaining programming or the most forceful programming. In school, it's forceful. On the internet, it's entertaining. Convincing them of ideas that you perhaps don't agree with. I've seen it myself on YouTube. I've seen a, a guy in America driving his car and his kids were in the back seat and he was arguing with them about an issue. Mm. And they was like, where did you hear that? School? He's like, why did the school tell you that? That's not true. And his own children are arguing with him because they learned it in school. Have you ever tried to take your children out of school? You'll get fined. You'll get in trouble. No, your kids have to go to school. Yeah. You have to give your kids away to the school. If you don't give your kids away to the, bro brain, the brainwashing, mm -hmm. you'll get in trouble. Yeah. And the reason they're doing this is because they want to control the youth because the youth is, of course, the future of the world. Of and you have to understand that this whole idea of feminism, this is what I'm saying. You're saying women don't, shouldn't vote. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we shouldn't allow children to be brainwashed. We shouldn't separate Absolutely. them from their parents to the point where Absolutely. they're going to absorb ideals. Like, and I've seen the Muslim community, the only ones standing at the gates of schools saying, yeah. you're not going to teach this to our kids. Absolutely. The only ones who will stand up against it. Because in the, in the white Christian traditionalist of, of England, the British, they just sit there and let their children ship them off for programming. Yeah. Just ship them off for programming. It's insanity. You don't raise your own kids anymore. Absolutely. And you know what's so ironic about this is that if you read the 30 articles of the Human Rights um, Convention, I think it's number 27 or something like this, which says that, uh, a, a human being has a right to educate their children or what, the, what their children is educated about. So on the one hand, they're saying, look, you can educate your child, you can yeah. choose what education they, they have. But on the other hand, no, it's the state, the Orwellian state, the thought police that must Correct. be there. Correct. So they've got a contradiction there. But what's even more pernicious, I think, as you said, is that it's, it, this is a religion. I mean, at the end of the day, I think anthropologists, maybe 100 years from now, are going to look back in Western civilization and say, a, an individual with, with these traits is identifying in this way. This is a mythology of some sorts, a fiction of some sorts. Yeah. And this is, some, this is a religion of the Western world. They, they sacrifice the, religion, the, the conventional idea of one God creating the universe for this preposterous idea or like this mythological idea that you, know, you can identify as X and you're, you're actually scientifically Y. And they're now trying to put this religion on our children. Now, you said it good in a video because I actually saw a video that you, a small clip, like, you know, a lot yeah. of your clips have become viral, like on shorts and yeah. uh, TikTok. And one of them was where you were saying that you can do what you want. I mean, in the West, just to be clear, I don't think either of us or any of us have said, no, we, we want to stop you from doing what Correct. you want. We're saying you can do what you want and we're not stopping you from doing what you want. We're not trying to encroach on your rights. You live in the West, you have your rights. But what we're saying is that we're, the red line is the children. Absolutely. They need to understand anybody with any idea. And we don't have to talk about particularly sexuality because people get offended for it. Let's talk about something benign that makes yeah. it a lot harder for them to cut me up and misconstrue me like they always mm. do. Let's talk about orange juice. If I don't like orange juice and I've had children that I'm responsible for. By the way, they'll, for, still, they'll still do it with orange juice. Yeah, they'll, I know they will. They'll say that he was analyzing. Uh, uh, of course they will. I can't yeah, win. Yeah. I can't win. But yeah. if, if I have children and I raise them and mm. I'm responsible for them and I decided to have them and I sacrifice them for them and I decide that I don't want them to drink orange juice, it's not fair for the government to come along and say, it doesn't matter what you want. We're going to force them to drink orange juice. Mm. And, and this is what they effectively do with so many of these ideologies. And you're right. It's to a degree, it's a religion. They are so fervent and so con so desperate for people to accept and believe in these things. This is why people say, oh, I'm an atheist. There's no such thing as an atheist. You either believe in God or you believe in the devil and you believe in the degeneracy. There's no, there's no in between. I've never seen anybody who's an atheist who's genuinely just neutral to these things, right? Mm. They always end up agreeing with this craziness. I think the main reason people call themselves atheists is so they have an excuse to do bad things and not feel guilty about you know, what, what they know innately is wrong. But you're completely right. It's completely unfair for people who have a certain ideology to come along and say that we must teach children my ideology regardless of what their parents believe and think. That's truly disgusting. And feminism and the whole idea of getting the mother out of the household and locking the children in these educational camps is the reason they wanted to do all this stuff. And they want to control 
the youth, especially the youth, because children are the easiest to manipulate to shape the future. And they're trying to shape the, the future of the children so that they are very good at ignoring their own innate moralities and also very good at ignoring their own eyes. Mm -hmm. When you said earlier about X and Y, I perfectly understood you. And we're on YouTube, so we'll have to talk very carefully. Mm -hmm. But if you can convince somebody that a giraffe is a horse, mm -hmm. and you can convince them that even if they look directly at a giraffe, that they, that they know that they, their mind tells them it's a horse, regardless of the fact that they can see a giraffe before their very eyes, mm -hmm. then they are completely open for all forms of slave programming. Once I you mean, get people to ignore their eyes, yep. well, then, then, then the game is complete, right? Uh, so yeah. this is purposeful. This is done yeah, on purpose. No doubt. I was doing, at, at one point, I did, a, like, I did a part of my postgraduate on gender studies, and I was speaking to this uh, person on the lift, and uh, she said that, well, you know, the penis is a social construct. Of course it so is. So I said, okay, well, no problem then in that, on that logic. Rape is a social construct. Yeah. Because I mean, it's the same thing. If you, if you take your belief to its logical conclusion, yeah. then it actually leads to things that you don't want to happen. For example, if you say that race is a social... If I can identify as a black man or a white man or whatever, then racism becomes a social construct. So it's, it's once again, it's, if, you, if you take your ideas and stretch them out, you get exactly the opposite of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And I, th I don't think this has been thought out properly. But these people don't think, and, and this is what's amazing. It shows what privileged world we live in. <laughs> yeah. They don't think, because yeah. their ideas, the reason they don't think is because their ideas aren't tested. When your ideas are tested mm. and challenged, you have to find a way to rebut and prove your ideas to be true. The reason their ideas aren't tested is because of censorship. If you yeah. argue against these ideas, they delete the other side of the argument, yeah. which means we now live in a false version of reality because one side of the argument is completely decimated and deleted. Yeah. Hence, the computers purport the matrix, and this is exactly where we are. If we could freely talk and argue against these points, they'd be gone. Yeah. But we can't, yeah. which is why they still exist, which is why false ideas, which should have been destroyed long ago, are now pertinent amongst the population because of the matrix and their media machine and the false computer generated reality we're forced to live under under the guise of censorship. And this is what yeah. this is what we say. I said this to somebody. They said, oh, man, you lost your Instagram. That's, that must suck. I'm like, yeah, OK, I lost Instagram. I can't show off my fancy cars. Cool. Mm. But it's not about that. This is about genuinely good versus evil. This mm. is about the fact that if you read any yeah. history book, the people yeah. who did the censoring were never the good guys. Mm. This is genuinely about the forces of evil versus God. That's what this is about. It's not about my Instagram page. It's about the fact that there are ideas that they have now that we can't talk against. For the last three years, they had this thing we weren't allowed to talk against. And look what it did to people. Look how it decimated people, locking them in their houses, destroying people's businesses, etc. And guess what's going to come next? Another idea we're not allowed to talk against. And another one we're not allowed to talk against. And people think that anyone who's ignorant enough to sit there and trust the rulers of Earth or their government and go, they're going to come up with ideas that I can't disagree with and nobody can disagree with. And those ideas are going to be good for me. Well, then you are a dummy and you deserve what comes next. Well, I think the mask has dropped with your, with your cancellation. Because at the end of the day, when with your cancellations, as if they couldn't contain themselves, it, it was as if they made a mistake. <laughs> yes, I, I, I would like to think that. I would like to think that we've now reached a critical mass and I was perhaps the last person needed to truly show the agenda behind how these people work. I think, yeah. it's a, I think it's a perfect storm of the fact that one, the things I talk about, they proved me completely right. Yeah. Two, I said I was gonna be canceled. Three, the, uh, they thought I was small enough to crush and they've realized that my fans are loyal enough to follow me anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I become more popular post-cancellation, yeah. which also inspires people, right? I think the number one, the reason cancellation was such a powerful weapon is because if they cancel you, you're done. But yeah. once I prove that's not the case, yeah, yeah. then people are going to go, you know what, this is such an important issue, I'm going to tell the truth anyway, because if they cancel me, I won't be done. I think with you it's a bit different, because I mean, you don't have a, you don't have a company or a program that if you cancel, then you lose all your customers. You, I mean, you are the product yourself. I mean, yeah. they can't t change your face or try and no. get rid of you. Well, well, they, well, <laughs> well they, they, can, they can try and <laughs> Maybe, maybe they will. It's, yeah, and that's, that's the only thing I will say about being canceled. Yeah, In yeah. terms of being canceled, I'm more popular than I've ever been. I've now moved over to Rumble, which is a YouTube competitor. Yeah. Rumble.com slash Tate Speech. You can speak with absolute freedom. It's just mm. as good as YouTube. I encourage everybody, anyone with a YouTube account, you can go to Rumble.com. Mm. You can back up your entire account with a few clicks of a button or download all your videos, upload them all automatically. Yeah. Get that done because YouTube will vanish you like this. So yeah. uh, that's Rumble where you can find me. But... Uh, yeah, the, the, the only bad thing about being canceled is you have three strikes. You, first, they try and shut you up and lie about you and hope you'll be quiet. And yep. if that doesn't happen, they try and put you in jail for something you didn't do. And if that doesn't work, they kill you. So when you lose your first strike, that is kind of scary to That's know it. now that, okay, they've told me I must be quiet and I'm not being quiet. Yeah. So they're sitting around going, oh, 
Big Mouth still wants to talk. Yeah, yeah. And they're coming up with a plan to try and make me be quiet. That is disconcerting. It I, is disconcerting. I, I, I think this is very relevant to the Muslim community, bro. Like, in general, because the reason why I feel like this cancellation should be, like, such a concern for the Muslim community is because if this can be done to you, yeah. because of X, Y, Z view that you have, or that you had before Islam, let's say, a lot of those views were commensurate with Islam, fully commensurate with traditional Islam, especially your traditional views, gender roles, so, yeah. so congruent with it. Now, if, if they're allowing you to, if, if they're doing that with you, then we're next. Absolutely. And we've got two choices. Either we preempt the situation, like yeah. what we're doing right now, yeah. and holding these unelected elites to account, yeah. Or we stay there as lame ducks and put our neck on the chopping board and we'll be next. Yeah, absolutely. And this is why, once again, when I was saying earlier about, about the reason I've adopted Islam and how you have red lines and things you stand up for, it's the Islamic community, the only ones I see who are outside schools trying to protest and protect their own children, They're the only ones who have a baseline moral fiber that can't be corrupted. We're here in Dubai, right? You could walk outside and find a construction worker in the heat for $300 a month. If you offered him a million dollars to denounce Islam, he wouldn't do it. He, did, he could not be bought. And, and, and let, me, let me say something else as well on that. Do you know, we talk about hypergamy, which I agree. I mean, all the, almost all the studies, like this one by King and stuff like that, shows that um, hypergamy is a, is a real thing, yeah. right? Um, that women will marry, uh, you know, across and up dominance yeah. hierarchies. However, there's one thing I'll say about Muslim women, right? For the most part, and no study has been done on this, but I, from my own experience, I'll tell you this for a fact. Yep. Yeah? If you go to 100 Muslim women, 1,000 Muslim women, and tell them, look, you know, this, you've got this millionaire, but he, he's not a Muslim. Yeah. You know, he wants to marry you. Yep. For the most part, I believe that they will reject that offer, which shows you a certain level of loyalty that we have as a community, that we have as, as Muslim people, which is inspired from the Quran, to be honest with you. Uh, you are the best community that was sent from the people and that the Prophet told us about these kinds of things and shows you quite frankly the strength of the Muslim community based on faith yep. a transcendental idea yep. and so that, that's one thing what, one other thing I will say is what really, I mean, what you are, I consider you as a, as a perpetual optimist you're yep. an optimistic person yep. and even post your cancellation you can tell it did affect you you're a human being yep. It, uh, bad things affected the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu You know, in the Quran, it says, nas, and God is speaking to the Prophet and says, you know, don't fear the people, fear me. Yeah. You know, and you fear the people, don't, don't fear them, but fear me. Th th these kinds of things. It did affect you as it would affect me, as it affect anyone. But what I continued seeing with you is reasons to make it good. Yeah. Perpetual optimism. And this is exactly Islam. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or it was said about him in a hadith, Kana fa'l. He used to love optimism. Optimism is an integral part of Islam. It's it, always finding a reason why this thing is good. Yep. And, and, and that is because at the end of it, and at the end of it, what is it? You're either, uh, your sins are being deleted from the Islamic perspective. When you go through a trial or a tribulation, your sins are being deleted. You're going through a challenge. It's strengthening your iman, your faith, your person, or it's putting you in a higher rank in the hereafter. Yep. In the, we believe obviously in heaven and hell. We believe in these things as real constructs. We don't believe in these things as metaphoric or something like that. So we believe that this is it's all, it's all only good things, really, yes. if you consider it. And so in many ways, one can see why a religion like that would, would suit someone like yourself. I mean, you, you mentioned Khabib Nagamedov before. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned like, you know, he's got training and then he's got praying and yeah. training and praying. And there's something else about Khabib, which I think is really powerful is that he represents, I think, a very virtuous thing, which is that he is both humble and confident. Yep. And, and that's where the virtue is. And at the end of the day, if you have that kind of mindset, a strong mindset, a disciplinarian mindset for yourself and for your family, I think that is, in many ways, it is the remedy for a lot of these mental health issues. Oh, absolutely. And I also think that God is, is, is pleased with you when you show him the beauty of his creation. I think that yeah. God is pleased with you when you work as hard as you possibly can and you do the best you can in anything you're going to attempt. God loves people who work hard and try hard. And in my own personal life, I can see that God is very happy with me when I give it 100%. And very few people give anything 100% anymore. Yeah. It's very rare you meet somebody and they, if they're honest with themselves and with you and with God, yeah. say, I gave it everything I had. They gave it some. They tried a bit. They got demotivated. They got distracted. They got tempted. But when you truly give your 100% to something, I think that makes God very happy with you. And I, I think he rewards us for that. What would, you be, what would your advice be to somebody? Because this is one thing that you're credited with even by your enemies, right? 
your detractors. They say that, you know, you can say what you want about him. Even Piers Morgan said that, but yeah. you know, you've given confidence to young men. Yeah. There's a lot of young men now, young women, that require that discipline. What kind of advice would you give them, practical advice? Yeah, I think that you have to live, there's a lot of practical advice I can give. Yeah. In terms of the religious sense, I would say you need to live like God is always watching. You may wow. have the opportunity to do something bad or you may have the opportunity to steal some money or snake somebody, but in the end, you're going to pay for that and the bill will be paid. Mm -hmm. I think if you do the right thing, in my experience, if you're a person who does the right thing, firm handshake, is on time, doesn't lie to anybody, does what he's supposed to do, is honest with a good heart, is genuinely polite to everyone he meets. If you are that person, you get very far in life. I have ne I've yet to meet people who just do all the simple things right who completely fail at life. But I've met a lot of people who snake or steal some money and they get really rich, then they lose it all, or they get rich and end up a gambling addict or depressed or et cetera. So you have to just understand that God is always watching. He's going to reward you in the end. That's the first thing. And the second thing I will say is that you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with and you mm. need to create your reality. I think the biggest problem with young people today is that they don't create the realities heavily enough. The people that they want to spend most time with aren't adding any value to their lives and then they end up wondering why they don't get anywhere. It's so interesting. As you speak, it's as if you're narrating hadith because it's what when you said God is watching. It sounds nicer <laughs> in Arabic. When you say it in Arabic, it sounds. I need to learn that part. No, right? honestly, there is a hadith that says that the highest form of uh, faith is that you should worship God as if He sees you. Because if He doesn't, if you don't see Him, He sees you. Yeah. And uh, on the on the friends issue, um, there's a hadith on that as well. Like you know uh, that uh, al khalilihi that the person is on the religion of his friends. Yep. So a lot of, like, as you say, this is a I, need, I need to learn it all. And this is, the, I'll say this now, the thing that yeah. was most daunting for me about converting was the amount I'd have to learn. Yeah. That's what's scary. No, no, take it easy. That's what's scary no, the, about it, look, you know? The, but I, I mean, I'm a fast learner. I'm not a stupid guy, but it's just yeah. like, okay, I have a lot to do. The know? Prophet Muhammad told us in hadith, in the din that the religion is easy. Yeah. No one tries to overburden themselves with the religion except that it defeats them. Yeah. In other words, take it incrementally. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Aisha, with the, one of the wives of the Prophet, she said that if the first thing that had been revealed to the people was this is a permissible and this is impermissible, people wouldn't have done it. Yes. So, you know, the first things that came down in terms of revelation were the verses of heaven and hell and these kinds of things. So I would say take it easy. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a journey. Yeah. Like, like It's like kickboxing, you know? Yep, yep, yep. You probably came in when you were a young guy, yeah, yeah, learning yeah. the roundhouse. Of and course, the, of you course. Know, it took you some time to kind yeah. of develop competence in, in that field. And it's, it's like anything else. So it's, it's, a, it's an easy process, but it's a, it's a gradual process. What I wanted to um, speak to you a little bit about is conceptions of masculinity. Okay. Yeah. So I think you've been criticized with that as well. Like, you know, the toxic masculinity. Supposedly, and kind of yeah. <laughs> Which is a very, such a vague term. It's almost like the community guidelines. What, what do you think they mean by that? Well, it's almost like the community guidelines of these social media companies, right? They mm. give this stupid definition of a term which basically can be applied to anybody and anything willy-nilly deciding whether they like you or not. It's very vague. It's not solid. What they're trying to say is that you're overly masculine and that some of the traits which are innate inside of you as a man are somehow now bad for society or for other people, yeah. which is absolutely insane to even try and conceptualize because that is, it's asinine and it's childish because like anyone with a brain understands that there are certain scenarios in life where particular qualities are completely applicable and permissible and there's certain scenarios when they're not. To sit and say it's toxically masculine for men to be violent is stupid because there are scenarios in life where you need a man to be violent. Yeah, if someone breaks into your house or if you yeah. go to war or if you yeah. call a police officer. Yeah. So it's not a matter of, you know, a certain subset of masculine qualities being labeled negative because these qualities exist because we've needed them for a very long time. And I argue we still need them it's today. It's only when it interferes with their interests. Right? <laughs> and only when it interferes with their interests. It's kind of funny. Mm. I was arguing with a feminist like I've done a bunch. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about toxic masculinity and she was talking about the idea that men are innately violent and how that's bad. And I said, you think that's bad because you're living in an extremely privileged society and a very privileged life. But I'll tell you that that's not bad because yeah. you even in and of yourself 
may not know this, but you like the idea of men being violent because let's say I lost my mind right now or let's say an, inter an intruder broke in and threatened you physically. Yeah, exactly. You would call a man to be violent for you. <laughs> You'd call the police and yeah, say, yeah, please yeah. be violent to protect me. <laughs> yeah. You believe in violence very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for you to sit there and say, oh, that violence is toxically masculine, but you call a toxically masculine man when yeah, the exactly. trouble comes exactly. shows that the whole idea in and of itself is hypocritical and it's garbage and it's stupid. And what they're trying to do is brainwash people people into thinking that if you stand up for yourself mm. or if you are true to the innate way we were built, the, mm. the things that are inside of us when we're born, that there's something wrong with you. They want you confused. They want you to sit and go, I'm a man and what's happening around me I think is unfair and it makes me feel unhappy about it and I want to stand up and talk and fight against it. They want to convince you that that's wrong and you're a bad person for wanting to defend your ideas. And I don't think that's the case. That's simply yeah. the absolute opposite, in fact. Absolutely. And the thing is, a lot of people will think that, you know, uh, this idea of a man is just simply that our idea of a man or the, the Islamic, say, for example, idea of a man is just this violent uh, creature. The truth is, like you said, violence is just an integral part or the ability, capacity to do it in situations where there's a need for it is just one part of the puzzle. Like, for example, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, one really interesting thing, we know he had nine wives at one time, yeah. which is very difficult to make. You can probably... Uh, uh, bro, nine's a lot. Imagine nine at one nine's time. Nine's a lot. And it's, 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 they are consistent relationships. It's not like divorce and marriage. Yeah, it's yeah. like you're actually living with these. So nine at one time, and then that's one thing. And then you've got, he had six children, all of which died in his lifetime. Wow. Only one of them survived afterwards. So he had to live with the grief yep. of that. His wife died at his time as well. He had to live with the grief of that. He loved his first wife, Khadija, uh, who was older than him. And she died. And so he had to live with that grief. He had to live with the grief of his uncles. Um, and so he, he dealt with that. We've got narrations of him crying when his son died. Yep. But, but what did he do? He didn't just, okay, cry and that's it, give up. He cried, and then he went to war the next day. Yeah. He cried, then he went done a sermon the next day. Yeah. He he he, you know, he he felt the grief, but then he could, you know, he had 19 wars that he participated in, wow. and it wasn't just these are not wars that he told other people to do. Where he sat in some some air conditioned place, he went and actually involved himself in these wars. Yeah. You know, he was fighting. He nearly died in one of those wars, so he was engaging in war. He was the leader of a polity. He had nine wives at one time, all managed and managing all that. He prayed half of the night. So imagine, like you said, you sleep four or five hours. The Prophet Muhammad SAW may have prayed for that long, like actually praying for that long. And that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. You know, he, his children died. He was directing the people. I mean, if you really think about it from a KPI perspective, key performance indicators, you know, for 1,400 years, people have been following the teachings of this man from the most grandiose of things to the most minuscule of things. I mean, this is influence. And even Pantheon, I think, is one of the uh, organizations that have ranked it. They've put him as number one because they can't, how can they? How could you not? How could you deny? His influence stretches cross culturally. It stretches historically, you know. And and then also we got the Quran. He's no, you know they got the hadiths. We've got thousands of hadiths. We've got the Quran. This is the role model for the Muslims. Yeah. You see what I mean? And it's a, a lot of men that nowadays. I'll be honest. Within the Muslim community and outside the Muslim community, we don't have. Those kinds of role models. Yep. We, the, the religious clergy are no, nothing like warriors, and the warriors are nothing like you know intellectuals or anything like that. Yep. And I, th I, don't, I cannot remember who had done this, um, who said this quote, but it was such a powerful one. It was an English. Uh, it was either or Aristotle or Socrates, I think, if it's the quote you're about to say. Uh, no, no, I don't remember the quote first. He said something to the effect of, "If you do, if you um, separate the fighting man from the thinking man, yeah. you have fools." That you have fools that fight, yeah. and you have cowards that think. Yeah, completely. And I, and I think it was a, there's a similar quote by either Socrates or Aristotle. Yeah, he said something very similar. He said, um, "If your if your warriors and your thinking men are separate, then yeah, you're, you nailed it. Oh, it's right. exactly exactly the same. I think yeah. it's one of those two. Mm. But no, and you're completely right. It's completely true. And that is what the world is lacking now as a whole. And it's yeah. kind of insane when you look at how the world works. You have these thinkers sitting around in some government building yeah. sending warriors to die. And the exactly. warriors don't understand why. And the thinkers are too scared to go do it themselves. Yeah. And it's kind of strange how whole society is even, you know, limping along as it is. But I agree with you. I think that's the, the essence of a complete man. And when you were telling me about the adversaries, uh, the adversities that were faced and how he stood up and he fought against them and moved forward anyway. I think this is what God wants from us, from all of us. It doesn't matter what the adversary is. It doesn't matter how much you're hurt by it. You need to allow it to motivate you to push harder and, and show your power um, and show your resilience. And it's, it's almost like 
even before I, I, I became Islamic, I very much understood that when bad things happen to me, this is a lesson from the universe or from God or from the Creator yeah. to, to, to stand up and show who I am and who wow. I can be and to mm -hmm. take all of the pain and anguish and disappointment and yeah. heartbreak and yeah. all of this and yeah. turn it into a force I can use for good and to make myself a better person. And I think if you don't approach life this way, that you're always gonna struggle. Because life is hard for everybody. It's gonna be hard. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. You need to be resilient to it. And I think that Islam is a fantastic way to understand exactly how to handle adversities and move forward, so. Well, um, I'll, I'm gonna end in a second, but I just wanna say one thing, which is that for those who don't know what Islam is, uh, Islam is a very, very basic religion. And it really is just a belief and worship in one God worthy of worship. As we've talked about today, it's not your desires, it's not the society, it's not the matrix or the LWL, yep. the liberal world order. It's not any of those things. Really, it's just belief and worship in one God. And it is the belief in all of the messengers, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and we believe the final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, who I've just described a second ago. And if, you, if someone just believes in those two things, actually for all intents and purposes, they're a Muslim, and then they, all they have to do next is start praying five times a day, which is what Andrew Tate has, uh, has done. It's been a pleasure having you on. I know you're a bit tired and it's fatigued, so I don't want to uh, make it all long for you, and we'll get something to eat after this. I don't know how long we've been talking for. How long have we been speaking for? I think that's a good time. Yeah, I think and we can do another one as well, especially sure. as my journey continues and as I learn more and as I get more knowledgeable, I would love in, in you know, a year or so or six, seven months, et cetera, we'd meet up again and do something. Absolutely, and if you need anything from us, obviously, we're always being in communication with you if you need uh, resources, research, anything Perfect. like that. Perfect. And you're part of the community. And one thing I want to say to the Muslim people is we must show loyalty and unity with Andrew Tate in the sense that he is now one of our brothers and it is uh, absolutely... Um, unforgivable to say things that some of these feminist Muslims have been saying and in fact if anything they need to be the ones who are refuted uh, Andrew Tate now is a brother of ours his sins have been completely wiped away uh, and and that really is that thank you so much Andrew for coming thank you thank you very much man and it's been educational and very interesting thank you my you friend too, man. Thank, thank you brother take care man